Hey folks, just wanted to take a second here at the top to tell you that while we're still in the midst of the actor's strike, this interview with Elizabeth Dennehy was actually recorded back on June 18th, 2023. So, that being said, enjoy the episode. Incoming transmission. The Klingonese word of the day is la. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. So, this is a huge victory for the good guys. Scotty, beam me up. Resistance is futile. Live long and prosper. You boldly go where no man has gone before. and welcome to the Computer Resume Podcast, the show covering the entire Star Trek franchise in chronological order and occasionally interviewing franchise alum for fans new and old. I'm your host, writer-comedian, Mr. Todd A. Davis. You've seen her as an officer, doctor, reporter, teacher, attorney, archivist. You know her as the lieutenant commander who dared go toe-to-toe with leg hiker Riker. You'll remember her as Fleet Admiral Elizabeth Shelby from the Picard series finale. She's an actor, Shakespeare geek, traveler, singer, teacher, supporter of young artists, and an absolute knockout. It's Elizabeth Dennehy. Yay! Elizabeth Dennehy. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm very well. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for carving out the time on the weekend to to sit down with me for, for a few minutes and go over your career. Um, you know, right off the bat, uh, how's your summer going? <laughs> great. Great. I'm in uh, Utah right now. Um, shooting a movie and um, today is sort of a day off and I'll be working tomorrow morning. I get have to be picked up at six in the morning. Wow. So. Yeah. So just cranking it out, just cranking it out. That's awesome. Can you, I, I mean, I want to get too far ahead, but can you give us any sort of insights as to like the genre or time period of the, of what you're working on? I don't want to get too deep into it in case you got an NDA or anything. I'm in a Western directed, written by and starring Kevin Costner called Horizon. And it's um, a four part, four part uh, feature film. I think it's four parts features that are going to be released serialized. And I have no idea when they're going to be released. So uh, I was here in September doing movie one and then uh, now I'm doing movie two. And, you know, I have no idea when I'm coming back for. I'm not in three, but I'm in four. Oh, wow. OK, Very cool. Exciting. Really fun. Yeah, really, really fun. Yeah. Um, I think there's, you know, for kind of for genre fans, it's kind of the idea is that Westerns were really, at least back in the day, Westerns were kind of the thing you could make really easily. But I feel like I feel like the state of film and television has progressed in that it's all kind of super high level of production, you know, uh, in every department. Um, and it's funny, I was actually going through IMDb earlier, but you know, just before we started to record and I was looking at all the things that are coming out and it was so many sequels and adaptations and things like that. Do you have any thoughts about like the state of the state of the entertainment industry? I'll say Hollywood television and film production from today, as opposed to when you got started. Oh, wow. Well, what? I mean, when I got started, there were four TV channels. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> there was uh, VHS. You had mm. VHS tapes. And that was about it. There was no cable. I was on my first, I did a bunch of commercials. And then my first, first job um, that got me into the Screen Actors Guild. Well, actually, that I got in for commercials to, uh, to SAG. But um, soap operas. And soap operas were huge back in the uh, 70s and the 80s. Um, and I think that they have kind of fallen out of style, you know, but there's so much competition for your time. There's thousands of channels and thousands of TV shows and series. And I think that there's a big difference between a story that needs to be told and it's so in depth that it needs multiple episodes. For instance, speaking of Westerns, Lonesome Dove amazing masterpiece book of course they made 
could not have captured everything in a feature film, which is about two hours, maybe three hours. So they made a brilliant TV series that was, I believe, 16 episodes, incredible cast, incredible writing, just wonderful. So there's a big difference between that, where you have to really take the time to tell the story properly, roots. And then a lot of times what we're seeing are people who are just trying to make money. Let's flog the horse to death. Right. I don't really watch those kinds of things, so I can't give you an example. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm not really a sci-fi fan, but you can tell when people, when these spinoffs and, and multiple multiverse stories keep being told and people say, oh, that was really, really lame. Usually when you hear that, it's because they're just trying to flog the horse and try to make as, as much money as they can before they've exhausted the story. Yeah, I think... Uh it's interesting talking about like serialized, you know, serialized narratives versus um, the procedural, you know, the kind of law and order, um, you know, a lot of the hospital based shows and stuff like that, um, you know, and especially on computer resume podcast in looking at Star Trek, you know, we, we saw the difference in television production, the, the show that everyone cites was ABC's Lost as the resurgence of the primetime serialized drama. And, you know, looking at some of those things, especially when you get into like the streaming surfaces, which are, you know, so popular nowadays, when you look at those narratives that you do really need to let the, the narrative and the character development have some room to breathe and grow it, it calls into question like those those things that are there to make money, but then the pieces that, you know, Breaking Bad, um, where we see these char characters develop over time. And, you know, for Star Trek, it was kind of big because when they started back producing Star Trek regularly in 2017, they went fully serialized, which was which was new territory. And I think with all of New Trek, I mean, we've got well, we had five shows. Um, Picard is now over and um, Discovery is wrapping up soon. But all of them have different kind of formats, but they're all sort of either leaning on or bouncing back and forth between the serialized and procedural format. But I, you, you talk about things that are early in your career for one of the things that we really champion on uh, Computer Resume Podcast and Cinema Shock are character actors we love character actors the folks that come in for an episode or two knock it out of the park and they're on to the next job it's sort of that uh, very uh traveling performer type vibe that you know from from the old days that doesn't necessarily uh that it is more of a rare thing nowadays but we also see a lot of those character actors and even some of the bigger stars get their start on soaps. And before we get really deep into everything uh, with your career, let's jump right to that. You actually started your career. If people pull up your IMDb, they'll see your first credit as I think uh, 20 some episodes of uh, Guiding Light. You played the character of Blake. Can you kind of can you kind of take us through maybe a bullet point of what it's like uh, the day to day working on a soap? Because I know soaps are very different from procedurals and uh, serialized dramas. Uh, what's it like on a soap? Well, um, uh, so I was on The Guiding Light in uh, before I played Blake. I actually did an arc, a story arc, playing a completely different character, and I cannot remember her name. But I uh, busted Vincent Irizarry out of jail. Oh, who, okay. Um, I can't so long ago i was in my early 20s and um that the, i was very lucky because i had i cut my teeth on a story arc where um there was an older actor god i can't remember his name either my brain who taught me a lot he was there mm. i was he was the prison warden and i was his assistant and the actor who's no longer with us um taught me a lot like in, in, in film, if you're making a, a feature film um, or you're making a filmed TV show, usually you have you have the distinction of one camera or three cameras. For like a sitcom, you'll have a three camera and uh, one camera, like uh, um, 
a one camera show, like say ER, for instance, or right. uh, I've, I worked on, um, you know, other shows where they have one camera and what you'll do is they'll shoot the coverage going this way. Mm -hmm. Then they break everything down, reverse the whole script, the, the set and shoot another way. Soaps, the soap I, I was on was at least like at least three cameras, maybe even more. And it was like a theater stage. The set didn't turn around. They didn't turn the lights around and all this set, which would take forever. Soap operas produce an hour of content a day. The guiding light was on every single day. Now, when you think about a feature film, like a, a film that has high aspirations for awards and, and stuff like that, like Horizon, the movie I'm shooting right now, they'll spend months. First of all, don't even get started on the writing. They've been writing this for decades, this right. full picture uh, story. So on a soap opera, if you're producing an hour a day, you can see the, the difference. So they have the, what's happening is instead of capturing everything with one camera, turning it around, turning it around, turning it around, master shot is a two, two part, two, a two shot, a single, and then editing it later. Soap operas are being edited it as they go so you have three cameras and the camera that has the light on that's what the audience is going to see and then that light goes off and then this light goes on and that's what the audience is going to see it's edited as it's shot so not only are they writing super quickly you're filming at the same time you're editing and the director's up in the booth saying okay camera three now camera two now we have a little bit of rehearsal so you know you know which camera is going to be on you so you 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 know when you're on and uh, but you you have very little control over what is actually going to be captured and shown. And that I found that very frustrating. So unlike a play where everybody can see your whole body and they can see two people coming closer and closer and closer together, soap operas are usually close up, close up, close up, close up, close up. You can't tell if the person's even in the same room. So it's sort of like theater because you're on a stage where the set doesn't move and yeah. change position. But it's not really theater because it's face, 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 face. Um, actually kind of like Zoom, you know, like you and I are both side by side like this. And if the soap operas had our faces side by side, it was it would be kind of similar. Oh, that's cool. So if in Zoom, it, it switched back and forth between if we were on speaker view, for instance, that's kind of like what the soaps are like. So you would I would get a script. I think I would get a script for the week. And I would go through the script on Monday, see where my scenes are. Your character has a number, number on the call sheet, you know. Um, uh, Alan Spaulding would be number one. Um, and you would have a number on the call sheet and you'd go through the script and highlight and throw away everybody else's pages and then start memorizing. And then we would rehearse in the morning and then shoot during the day. And on uh, Guiding Light, you there was a higher hierarchy to the shooting order this is probably really really boring but it would be the stars like alan spaulding the people who've been on the show for a really long time the ones making the big bucks they would shoot all their scenes first so that they could leave the other thing the other hierarchy is if they had a big set like say a diner set where a lot of scenes are and you've seen on soap opera, it's like so everybody drops into the diner that day because they have the setup so all the scenes will happen and they'll, so they'll shoot all the scenes on that set, which will take care of a lot of people. It's people, I was on it for a year. And uh, speaking of Trek, Michelle Forbes and I were dressing roommates. We were, we, we were really good friends on, oh, that's uh, awesome. on the guy. Yeah. She, she and I shared a dressing room. So then your day. So for me, it was kind of like an underling. I mean, I was a late hire. I wasn't a star. I was just starting out in the business. I would be there all day. I would rehearse my scenes because Grant Alexander, who was Philip Spaulding, he was high up the food chain. So his scenes would be done first. So all of this is a long explanation for me to lead up to tell you a funny story when I got on Star Trek. So I would get to the show at like six o'clock in the morning. We would rehearse all the scenes. Then I would sit in hair and makeup and then wait all day long Why all those stars. Sometimes I would go to the gym. I would have time to go to the gym and come back because the stars would be shooting their scenes or there'd be a massive funeral home scene or a massive, uh, you know, scene in a castle, whatever. And I would have, I would be there all day long. So when I got to start a uh, uh, Star Trek Next Generation playing uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Shelby and I auditioned for the show and I got hired, I showed up on the set with my line sort of kind of 
learned, but I knew that I was going to have all day to learn my lines. Ha ha joke on me. I did not know that in TV, in professional TV world, in prime time, you go in, you have a call sheet. This scene is first. We rehearse the scene while they're lighting the stage and rehearsing where the camera moves. You're getting hair and makeup. And now you're going right back in to shoot that scene. So my very first scene was a scene. I think it's called the ready room where I had the line that I could not say because I didn't learn my lines well enough. And it was projection suggests that a Borg ship like this one could continue to function effectively, even if 78% of it were rendered inoperable. I will take it with me to the grave now because I <laughs> could not get it out of my face then. I had no idea that it was going to be working that fast. I don't know why I wasn't fired. I should. I think nowadays I would have been fired. I should have been probably fired, but thank God they didn't fire me. The next day I came in, I had learned all of my lines for the whole episode in my bones, learned them. Um, I was so horrified by how bad I was the first day. Wow. I, I mean. But they don't teach you this stuff in school. My son was a theater major at DePaul um, and he graduated about four years ago. And I said to him, Whatever you learn, make sure they teach you how to read a call sheet, how to understand what's going to happen to you when you show up on a set. Yeah. Because when I was in school, they didn't teach us that stuff. I had no idea what I was doing. Well, uh, you know, let's kind of let's uh, let's work our way backwards here. You mentioned school. And I mean, for the folks who have a notion in their head of like going out and getting discovered in Hollywood or something like that, like these folks didn't just show up like <laughs> they've put in the work, they've put in the training, uh, you know, and you kind of, I always think of um, that scene in Batman begins where Liam Neeson's telling Christian Bale, like, you know, being able to do this stuff is like preparation and patience. And I'm like, wow, that is the description of like working in a creative field. Like just be as educated as you can and be as ready as you can and there's still an element of luck, but you, uh, you actually studied at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Is that correct? Well, I was a theater major at Hofstra University first. Oh, okay. Okay. My uncle, my father's brother, Ed, was a theater major at Hofstra. And when I, now children, cast your mind back in time to a time where there was no computer, no internet. When you were applying to college, you I don't even know how we found out about what schools were good. I can't even remember how we did that. I think it was just word of mouth or oh, wow. magazines would publish. I guess there would have been like backstage or theater magazines where they would publish ads. Everybody knew that Juilliard was the best and the hardest to get into. But I auditioned for, um, remember I auditioned for Purchase and my uncle, because my uncle had been a theater major at Hofstra and my mom went to Hofstra on Long Island which is where I grew up. I auditioned for, uh, actually, I, I don't think Hofstra had an audition. I auditioned for Purchase and I applied to Hofstra and I got in there. So I was the theater major for four years at Hofstra. And then after four years, I was really, really immature, very um, not ready for the world. And I was a huge Anglophile. And somehow I learned I honestly can't remember. I learned about the London Academy. Everybody knew about Lambda. Everybody knew about RADA. I don't know. How, it's so hard to imagine how we knew about this stuff without the internet, but we knew. And so I guess what you did was you wrote a snail mail letter to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts and said, please send me your literature. And you've got a big envelope with the brochure and you would fill it out and then send it to them. And then they would call you or send you, I mean, isn't it unbelievable to think of how slow yeah. processes that were? How slow, like now it's like we want an answer right away. Oh, and if yeah. we don't get one, we're so frustrated. So then you get an appointment and I went into New York and I had auditioned for a bunch of schools and uh, Lambda was my last audition. And so Lambda has a three, they still to this day, has a three-year program, which is mostly for kids right out of high school. Okay into which they will take a few overseas kids. And then they have a one-year program. So your first year, you're an A. Second year, you're a B. Third year, you're a C. And then they have this one-year program. I was a D. So I 
went there for the one year program for overseas students and it was life changing, absolutely life changing. And um, it's interesting because I have a very strong classical training, but I was um, really into um, period things way before, like when I was a little kid growing up, um, I was obsessed with like, you know, the Jane Austen and uh, Upstairs, Downstairs and Merchant Ivory films and The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Brideshead Revisited. That was my jam. I was an Anglophile, you know, right away. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was doing my costume fitting and uh, the horizon is set right after the Civil War. Yeah. And I my daughter wears a hoop skirt and a corset and a petticoat and I have a wig and a bonnet and all of that. And they, I did my wardrobe fitting and I just said, 13 year old Elizabeth is freaking out, totally freaking, freaking out. And then I found out the other day that uh, movie four takes place like 15 years later. So yeah. we said, well, is it hope? I'm not wearing a hoop skirt. What it? What it, is it? A hoop skirt still? And she said, "Oh no, you're gonna have a bustle." And I was like, 14 year old Elizabeth is freaking <laughs> out, freaking out." Oh, that's awesome! That's so, so great. Went, yeah, so I went to Hofstra for four years, met like lifelong friends, had a great time. I uh, did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of acting, a lot of stage, and then I went to Lambda for a year, and I was still friends with some of the teachers at Lambda. As a matter of fact, my son who's uh, following the family legacy, did a two-week program at Lambda over the summer. Uh, oh, that's a couple awesome. of, he was in high school still. Is uh, do, So if you're a big Anglophile, does he have a particular uh, genre or era that he, that he prefers? You know, he actually does love Shakespeare, and he did start out. Um, so my son... Um, when he was a senior in high school, we we love this uh, independent Shakespeare company. Please donate to them in Griffith Park. Uh, they do free Shakespeare in Griffith Park and they're amazing. I'm on the board and I work with them. I did Cyrano de Bergerac with them. And then when Jack was, my kids grew up going there. And you know, it's interesting. You take kids to see Shakespeare and you think, oh, they're gonna be bored. And I said, don't worry about trying to understand everything. Just, you know, watch, pay attention to what's happening. Don't get bogged down in the words that you don't understand. They loved going. We would go with friends every year. And then my husband said, you should audition for them. So his senior year of high school, before he went off to college, he did uh, Romeo and Juliet. He's a, he's a, a musician. He can pick up pretty much any instrument and learn something. So we did three seasons with them. So he, his first love, his first foray was, um, was summer Shakespeare. And he actually really misses it. And I'm like, my work here is done. I feel very, <laughs> oh, that's, that's... Very, very proud. But he, he, um, he is in the weird Al Yankovic biopic. Did you see that movie? I did. Yes. He's the guy who goes, dude, I've got chills. He's the blonde guy. Oh, that's so funny. I yeah. really enjoyed that movie. And those and those guys, especially in those scenes there in the apartment, were so funny. I really, really yeah, enjoyed that. The blonde, curly-haired guy. That's that's my boy. Oh. And uh, he just shot three episodes of The Bear. So oh, cool. Super, nice. super so his, it's interesting that you ask because I am so glad he is age, that I'm not his agent because... To me, he looks like a cherub. He's got blonde curly hair and he's a tiny little slight boned guy. And yet his agents send him out and he constantly is getting cast as a meth head in drug. <laughs> he did Power Force 4 and it was a drug deal gone wrong. And I'm like, I think it's because he's so skinny. <laughs> he has He's in a, a movie called Monsters of California that Tom DeLonge directed from Blink-182. Oh, okay. He plays a total, like, you know, um, a total druggie in oh, that. that's funny. And I think it's because he's so skinny. So, um, yeah. And then I don't know what the, he, I don't know what he's playing on the bear. He won't tell us. Oh, it's the bear's been one of those, uh, been one of those shows that's been on my radar for a while. I haven't pulled the trigger on it just yet, but, uh, you know, working with, uh, you know, being a stand-up comedian and having a lot of friends in the service industry, stand-up comedians, you're obviously in, you know, clubs and bars and stuff, all that. So all, that whole world is already pretty familiar to me. So I've been, I've been wanting to pull the trigger on that for a while. Um, so uh, going back and you mentioned uh, your family and the family business, uh, you know, there's, I think there's like a notion of kind of going along in with the the tradition of the family business but then there's also an idea of like oh, I'm going to break away and do my own thing like because 
your family is so in this industry. Uh, what Was that ever a question for you of like, I'm going to do this acting thing or no, I'm going to do my own thing. And like, when did that decision get made? Like in your own heart, mind, soul, like how did that happen for you? Um, so I came out of the womb, like singing, tap dancing, look at me, look at me, look at me. Um, so I, I have, I, wonder the question really is if i if my father hadn't been an actor would i have pursued it independent of that because i was look at me look at me look at me mm -hmm. uh, so which came first i have no idea but we grew up um my first of all my parents were really really young when they had uh back in the 50s like for the pill and stuff like that my mother was 19 when she gave birth to me oh, wow. at camp Lejeune. my father was in the marines and she was one of the old moms she was an older mom there oh, wow. and they had three kids and they were like you know i think my dad was like 26 and had three kids and so at that point it was like just take any job just to put food on the table but he never stopped doing theater. He created a uh, community theater um, in Amityville, where I grew up, Amityville Community Theater. Or, um, and we were in the shows. We were, you know, um, kids, the No Neck Monsters and Cat Mahatsen Roof, the Snow Children and Carousel. That was normal for us. So do, we would go to school at night. We would go to rehearsal at the Amityville High School. And on the weekends, we were so teching a show and costumes and makeup. And my mom was a stage manager. That was what, that was normal. Like how, you know, how some families, it's all about sports and the whole oh, weekend yeah. is all about sports. For us, it was all about shows and ballet lessons. And um, so I had a dad who was struggling to make ends meet working. He was a motel manager. He was a meat trucker for a while. He worked for Burlington factories. He was doing all these jobs. So was my mom. She was a waitress. And then you had the fun thing that happened on the weekends. So of course, if there was a way to make a living doing the fun thing, I think I was going to gravitate towards it. Yeah. Uh, my and father was... All of my friends, I would go to their houses and their fathers had get up in the morning, get the briefcase, the suit and the tie and trudge off to the train, to the city, go to work. And sometimes they would ask me, they would say wistfully, how did your dad have the courage to do that? How did your dad do it? And I would hear them and I'd go, oh, thank I'm so glad that my father did. You know, I mean, when he started working in films and TV, he started being away from home. So that was hard because my mom had to do everything herself, but he was living his dream. And that was a great role model for us. Yeah. My, uh, I'm the youngest of three and my, our, our parents had us generations apart. My, the middle, my, my next oldest brother, the middle brother is 13 years older than me. My oldest brother is 20 years older than me. And um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my dad was a Marine as well. And so uh it, you're, you're saying a lot of things. I'm like, boy, this sounds really, really familiar. <laughs> but wow, I, I can't imagine those age gaps. Yeah, big, big age gaps. Uh, to, a little funny story about my family is, um, you know, mom had uh, all, again, had us very far apart. And so when my mother was pregnant with me, she went to a grocery store or whatever, was shopping around with my oldest brother. So when they went through the cash, uh, when they went to the register to check out, um, the cashier saw my mom, who was very pregnant, looked at my brother and said, I bet I know who's pregnant. And my brother looked at her and said, I bet you don't. <laughs> so, yeah. And wow. when I was when I was growing up as a, you know, four or five, six year old, I would hang out with my middle brother, who was again, 13 years older than me. So he had a car and could drive around and the whole thing. So we would walk around looking like father and son, but acting like brothers who would tease each other, call each other names and the whole thing. And we would get looks from people of like, how can this father let this child talk to him that way? <laughs> oh, that's but, so yeah. And my, my parents, uh, you know, worked, steadily worked. And so when it came time to raise the third one, it was, 
we're kind of tired. So we're going to set him in front of the television and let uh, cartoons raise him during the day. And when I was hanging out with my brother, he was in the demographic for David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, um, all those, uh, the kids in the hall, all those types of shows, which ended up kind of shaping my sense of humor and led to me doing stand-up comedy. But it's it's so funny, like the choices the parents make and, you know, where you grow up and how everything is formed. You mentioned uh, Camp Lejeune, which is here in the Carolinas. Like, uh, do, you, do you get back to the Carolinas much at all? Never no. been. <laughs> I mean, I was I was born there when I and when I was two, we moved uh, to Long Island and lived with my grandparents. I've never been back to North Carolina. I would love to go here. It's beautiful. Yeah, it, it's a it's a really nice place. We're here in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so it's kind of a you know it's eight hours to Orlando, eight hours to Philadelphia. It's you know you know and a couple hours to the beach, an hour to the mountains. We're kind of in a nice uh, middle spot here. But uh, anyways, getting back into getting back into everything uh, before we move on into, you know, sort of the the deep the deep dive on your career. I got to know a, a little bit about Tony and Tina's wedding. Uh, I saw I saw this and was just I, and I read I ended up, you know, clicking the link and reading more about it. It sounds like a very immersive theater experience like there's a little bit of improv there's a little bit of audience participation but there there is this kind of overarching story can you give me the yes. rundown and your experience with tony and tina's wedding so when i went to college went to hofstra university and um two a couple of my friends uh nancy cassara and mark nasser would you know how you clown around with your friends and he would be like tina Get in here and and uh, where's my dinner? Make me a plate. If you don't, I'm going to smack your... They would just improvise this couple, Tony. They weren't actually a couple, but they would pretend, you know, I'm from, we're from Long Island. They would pretend to be this like heavy, heavy Queens accent. And we were all out of college and living in the city. And then they had the... Mark Nasser had the idea, what if Tony and Tina got married and the audience was the congregation in the church. And then you moved to another venue and you went, went to the reception. And so we started having these meetings, talking about and sharing funny stories of weddings that we'd been to. And that this was going to be like the most Italian wedding, Long Island, you know, with the chocolate fountain and, and the works. And I played Donna Marsala, one of the bridesmaids, and I had been to a wedding where one of the bridesmaids got up and sang. And uh, so we had this idea that I was, I that I was going to sing. And, uh, and I was in, like, my character was a Madonna wannabe. And uh, we, you know, I had the lace fingerless gloves. This is how long ago this was children, the black uh, bracelets. And um, we, when we started out doing the show, um, Tina and her bridesmaids had won a dance slash lip sync contest. And so we performed the number that we did, the lip sync number, and it was Cold Hearted Snake, Paul Abdul. That's how old I am. Oh, wow. So we would perform this and sometimes people would come, people would bring friends to the show and tell them they were going to a wedding. And the people didn't realize that it was a show. It was completely improvised. And we would improvise with the audience. One night we were in the, in the uh, church. In, it was a, a church in the West Village. And then we would all walk to the reception hall. And when we were in the receiving line on the church steps, I looked down the aisle and my gynecologist is coming. My gynecologist is at the show. Dr. Lewis Lewinstein is at the show. And the Connie, the bridesmaid, the maid of honor, was she was not pregnant in real life, but she played like she was hugely pregnant. And I had to quickly decide if he was going to be himself, but I had to quickly decide how I was going to know him. And so in in split second, I was like, Dr. Lewinstein, I didn't know you knew Tina. Oh, my God. And I introduced him to... Um, my boyfriend, Wally Fabrizio, who greets uh, Dominic, Dominic Fabrizio, and he greets him and he goes, so uh, you and I are the only ones who know what's going on down there, right? Oh and then I introduced him to Connie, the bridesmaid. I was like, if your water breaks, you're, you've are you got it covered. Dr. Lewinstein will take care of you. And he was screaming with laughter. We just said, okay, he's my guy now and go with it. That's so funny. So it was all, we would do that for three hours every single night, dancing, 
we were the bridesmaids, so I danced every single night. Then I would go home and learn my lines for the soap opera and get up at five o'clock in the morning and be on the guiding light. I don't that's know how so, it. Oh yeah. Oh my God, that schedule. <laughs> but I mean, that sounds like such a foreign, I, th- there's very, I think there's very few things like that nowadays. I know um, uh, we were talking a little bit before we started to record about uh, my first trip to New York. I got to see Khan the musical uh, which is a Star Trek, which is a Star Trek musical of the movie Wrath of Khan, but it's told from the perspective of Data on uh, the Enterprise D in the holodeck. So the way that they play it is that the audience are, it, it's a hologram audience. So Data is talking to a bunch of holograms and the, there's a little bit of audience participation, but not nearly to the degree of Tony and Tina's wedding. That's so funny. Um, oh, we, were, we were dancing with the people. You were online for the bathroom with them. We improvised the whole thing. And what was great about it was it wasn't, I didn't feel the pressure that to be funny. It wasn't like you need to be a laugh a minute. I would go to people and go, okay, who's sexier, Madonna or Marilyn Monroe? And we would just debate about that. Oh, that's Cause it was, it was being real. It yeah. would not, the goal was not to be funny. And the, the structure of it was, was it was all improvised, but it had a shape. If you think about a three ring circus, the center ring um, gets all the focus. Yeah. And so we would run around directing the audience's focus. So like when Tina's ex-boyfriend showed up at the wedding reception drunk, it was like, Oh my God, Michael's here. Did you see him drink? Was he drinking? And we would run up to audience members feeding them the story and show, throwing the focus to what's taking the center ring right now, what's on wow. center stage. And uh, then you would talk about, oh yeah, Michael, he's a mess. You know, he's just so heartbroken in love with her and engage the audience in that way in, in the family drama of what was going on. That's so funny. Cause it's kind of, so it's kind of like if two people were on opposite sides of the room, they would get the same story, but kind of diff from different perspectives and different uh, emphasis on different angles. That's so awesome. Oh, yeah, and if you man. were talking to Tina's mom, Mrs. Um, uh, oh God, Mrs. Vitali. If you were talking to Mrs. Vitali, who disapproved of Tony's father, so the bride's mother disapproved of the groom's father, Tony Nunzio, whose wife was dead, but brought his girlfriend, who was a stripper, and then so the stripper, the people who were talking to the stripper, probably love her. But if you were to on or if you were on team Mrs. Vitali, you'd disapprove of her too. And you would have this whole perspective. And of course she stripped during the reception, got up on a table and stripped for that. Um yeah, it was wow. it was a wild free for all and uh, really fun. That's so awesome. I, let me let me ask you this before before we get uh, too much further, because you know, not after not long after uh, your time on the soap is when uh, you did uh next generation. Uh, the legendary two-parter best of both worlds did you I mean not being a science fiction fan but being a working actor did you have any sort of perspective on Star Trek before getting the job no so as I said (laughs) since I was the one who was into upstairs downstairs the six wives of Henry the eighth and I I really mean no disparagement because now I realize that sci-fi is really cool, but I went to an all girl Catholic school and you know who the fans were, who were into Star Trek. They were not the cool kids. (laughs) Yeah, no, that, that tracks. (laughs) They were the scientists and the mathematicians and they were the straight A students and they were the geniuses who were presidents and ran everything, but it wasn't where the cool kids hung. And uh, not that the kids who were into brides have visited upstairs, downstairs were, but um, yeah, no, I was all Partridge family and love American style and uh, <laughs> Brady Bunch. Um, no, Star Trek was not on my radar at all. I don't know why sci-fi never really took off with me. It just didn't, I, my, the books I read, I loved biographies. I loved actor biographies. I, I can remember being young and devouring everything on Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier. And uh, yeah, my, I was really uh, an Anglophile from, you know, from, from as far back as I can remember. So yeah. no, no, no inkling of Star Trek. I mean, I knew, I knew who William Shatner was. Was there any sort of shift uh, after, was there any sort of shift after you were on Star Trek? Like, it, like, in, was there a was there a shockwave of like, oh, 
this this is a this is a thing I've because watched ep- I've watched three episodes in my life: Best of Both Worlds Part One, Best of Both Worlds Part Two, and my episode on Picard. My my friend Austin Titchener, who's a huge fan, and he runs the Reduce Shakespeare Company podcast. He mm-hmm. said, "What did it feel like you were on the ship? That ship?" And I was like. I had no idea what ship I was on or why it was important. <laughs> but I actually think that that's a good thing for Shelby. Otherwise, I would have been nervous and intimidated. But that whole like fearlessness and not 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 wanting to be liked, I didn't care if uh, people liked me or not, but just coming in to get the job done. If I had been aware, if I had been a fan, if I had been, I would have been cowed by it all, I think. And I don't think I would have been as brash and polarizing as I was, because Jonathan Frank said to me on uh, Best of Both Worlds, he said, you have absolutely no idea what you're doing or what's going to happen to you, do you? And I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, the conventions. I said, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> Crazy talk. Well, what are you, you know, talking about? It's it's funny that you mentioned, because uh, that was going to be my next thing before we moved on, was, um, you know, I, I recently went and just rewatched the scene of you and Frakes in the turbo lift. Decade Battle Bridge. Halt. Commander, you and I need to have a conversation. You never ordered me not to discuss this with the captain. You disagree with me? Fine. You need to take it to the captain? Fine. Through me. You do an end run around me again? I'll snap you back so hard you'll think you're a first year cadet again. May I speak frankly, sir? By all means. You're in my way. Really? How terrible for you. All you know how to do is play it safe. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man for as long as you have, passing up one command after another. Proceed to deck eight. When it comes to this ship and this crew, you're damned right I play it safe. If you can't make the big decisions, Commander, I suggest you make room for someone who can. How did that play out? What was it like working, working with Frakes? I mean, you're in a, I mean, I'm I'm sure, you know, that set probably comes apart to get the camera in there and everything. But from the perspective of the audience, you're in a tight space face to face with this actor. And just, it, it's a, it is a meaty scene. Do you, you have any thoughts about going into it? What was it like during, you know, working with Frakes? Any, any thoughts to any of that? Well, first of all, um, I was 28 got the audition, got the job. I was like, okay, cool. This is the way my life is going to be. And and, um, on the set, he had worked with my father. They had done um, uh, lunchtime theater in New York showcases, like not Broadway, off Broadway, uh, Julius Caesar and Ivanov with a theater called the Impossible Ragtime Theater. So he knew my dad and he knew my uncle. I think they had been at Penn State together. So built in respect and he was just could not have been nicer he he could tell that I was really green and you know I was so so young at uh, 28 and uh it's so weird that my son is like 26 and I just see so many echoes but he uh he said my my trailer was your trailer you know because of course he had a huge trailer and whatever you need whatever you want he really was incredibly kind and helpful they all were everybody was but One thing that I don't think people realize is that when we were shooting part one, we did not know what was going to happen in part two. We never saw the script for part two. Right. So we didn't know if I was a Borg in disguise and infiltrating and going to bring down the whole thing. We didn't know if we were going to end up in bed together. We didn't know if we were going to end up killing each other. So we had to find certain areas where we could plant little Easter eggs so that Whatever the second part brought out, you could it would track. So all of those little side long uh, side eye glances of like, yeah, I really showed you is were put in there in purpose in case I turned out to be a villain or not very nice person. And all of the we like we 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 talked about how we should have this mutual attraction and respect for each other, even though we clash. Like she, he said, she reminds me of me when I was at that age what happened to that fiery person Mm. and that there would be some heat there in case we ended up falling for each other we just didn't know and that's something that i we he 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 knew from the soaps because of genie and i knew from doing the soaps that you would be having this huge huge fight in a boardroom with somebody and the next week you were in bed with them 
So you had to, even if you were doing a scene where you it looked like you were enemies, there needed to be that kind of tension and friction of like, this could turn into anything. And we had no idea where the story was going. We had no idea what was going to happen. So that I love the moment where I say, um, uh, data, scramble the phaser frequencies, keep them guessing. And it works and the tractor beam gets released. And I'm standing there and I'm like, really proud of myself. And Picard comes up and puts his hand on my shoulder, like step down, very good, but step down. I love that moment because it, it shows that anything was possible. Any yeah. of those, any of those options could have been possible at that moment. That's so interesting of, you know, trying, cause I, I guess in a, you know, from the fans perspective, it seems like everything is so meticulously planned out, but it's interesting to hear that it was structured to have versatility based on what was coming next. And that's, that's really fascinating. I absolutely love that. And thank you again for your performance. It was, uh, you know, legendary, legendary performance in that. It's, I, I have that two-parter in it on its own Blu-ray and it's prominently on my shelf. It's such a, such a great episode. Um, weren't, did you watch it in real time when it aired? No, unfortunately, no. I had to, I caught it in syndication. You weren't even born yet, right? Uh, I was born in eighty three, so that was sad. I was around, yeah, I was around, but I think, yeah. <laughs> so remember, at back then, I think there was VHS at that time, but nobody knew how to work it. Yeah. And that summer, everywhere I went, people were like, "I hate you! I hate you! It was horrible." And I went to go to the conventions. People were like, "Oh, I hated you! You were such a bitch to Riker." Um, yeah, no, it was, it was not pleasant. I don't know if you saw the ready room interview with Will it's changed in 30 years. Uh, conventions when I started were for a very specific kind of person, yeah. a very outlier, you know, um, fanatical kind of person. Yep. Comic Con in San Diego, I think made, made conventions cool. So now you go to conventions and you see young people, hot people, cool people who are into cosplay. But back then in the early 90s, mm. it was a kind of a fringe thing. Mm. I Again, I, I say this with absolute respect. If it rocks your world, go for it. But Galaxy Quest, like what, what they captured in Galaxy Quest, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. It's changed a lot since then. Now when I go to conventions and you see families with young children and they're all so into it and it feels hip and cool and trendy and fun and not sort of fringe. Now I hear, I loved you. You were such a great role model. And that makes me so happy that things have changed in 30 years. So that, you know, a woman doesn't, you know, isn't going to get ahead by making men feel like it's their idea that she could be brash and outspoken. And, you know, I think I think of Shelby as one of those kids in school who always put the hand up, oh, oh, pick me, pick me, straight A student who always knows the answer. Of it's course. annoying. It's annoying, but are you really going to clamp down on this zealous enthusiasm for learning and curiosity and how things work and problem solving? So I, I get what how, she, how that can be annoying because those people can be, but... Um, but she was right and she saved the day. So, yeah, you know, she, she is such a fascinating character. I think, I think the one thing I didn't like was that we didn't get more of you that, I mean, that we didn't, we didn't get to see you again. Well, we didn't get to see you again until uh, she appears in lower decks. And then of course, uh, you know, you make uh, uh, quite a, quite a return in Picard. We'll get there. We'll get there eventually. I do have a couple of, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, I have a couple of, you know, it's interesting to talk about the conventions. Uh, when I, I, I want to say it was maybe mid nineties or maybe late nineties when I, when I wanted to go to a convention here on the East coast, heroes con out of Charlotte, they've been running for 30 plus years, but my father, again, Vietnam veteran Marine, I, I couldn't drive. So he drove me and he was going to go in with me. And I was like, okay, dad, just so you know, this is the type of people you're going to see. And I proceeded to give him kind of the rundown of like the stare at that time, the stereotypical fan that was walking the floors of this convention. And he looked at me like I had three heads. And as soon as I finished my description, he, he and he was kind of, of course, disbelieving what I was saying. But as soon as my description finished leaving my lips, 
three of what I just described walked right in front of us. And he was like, did you do that with your mind? (laughs) (laughs) Fast forward years later. uh, I don't think my wife and I were married just yet, but same convention. I said, Hey, I'm going to this convention. Do you want to go? She had never been. So she came with me and that particular convention center there in Charlotte, you actually enter on the ground level, but it's, you go uh, down two floors to get to the convention floor. But on that ground level, there's these floor to ceiling windows that look out over the entire convention floor. And so we get up there and to those windows, but just before you go down the escalators, but we get up to those windows and she just wide eyed, open mouth, just wow. And I, and I looked at her and I said, pretty, pretty, pretty neat, huh? And she looked at me and goes, I've never seen so much useless crap in one place. <laughs> Oh, okay. Let's go have fun. <laughs> Pretty amazing. My very first convention was in St. Louis, Missouri with George Takai. And I was scared to death. I was so scared that I thought that people were going to tear me limb for limb because I was an imposter and I did, wasn't a, sci, a sci, Star Trek fan or a sci-fi fan. And who did I think I was? And I was sitting at the table signing stuff with, with George. He was sitting next to me and this, very large guy shows up in full on Starfleet uniform with a stack like this, like six feet high of VHS tapes of every film that George Takai has ever been in, all the Japanese films for him to sign. And I sat there next to him while he was signing all of these, like these people are not playing. This is hardcore. That was my introduction. And I was so nervous when I went on stage for my talk, I had three Bloody Marys before I went on stage because I was terrified that people were going to be like, you don't deserve to play Shelby. <laughs> you don't deserve this part. Oh, that's so and people funny. could not have been loved. They were so nice. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's it's been my experience that, um, you know, the fans are obviously, as you mentioned, very hardcore, but at the same time, because there was such a stigma around certain veins of fandom that for the longest time, it was still very much a open and welcoming place. And I think that, I think that is the one thing that has kind of carried over of, Hey, you're a fan. Come on, let's, let's go. It's a, it's a very, it seems to be a very open and very welcoming um, type of uh, environment. Uh, Moving on. The next thing that I have here is that uh, you appeared on an episode of Quantum Leap in an episode directed by Scott Bakula, like Captain Archer from Enterprise, Scott Bakula, and of course the lead of you know Quantum Leap. Uh, do you have any uh, memories of you know being on that set? What it was like to be directed by Scott Bakula? You know, actors turned directors. You know, again from a fan's perspective, seem to have a very particular vein of focus they tend to you know you hear an actor's director um you know that type of phrase get thrown around what was what was it like being directed by scott Bakula? well first of all little um tidbit an easter egg dwyer brown was in that episode who was in um he played uh kevin costner's father in field of dreams coming full circle oh so- wow so Dwyer Brown was a bank robber. We were being held hostage in a bank. And and, and uh, Dennis Dugan is a movie director. His parents, Marion and Charles Dugan, um, played an old couple who were also being held hostage in the bank. And they were in their 80s then. They had been married 50 years and their wedding anniversary was the week we were shooting. And Scott had brought, brought in a giant wedding cake and we all sang happy anniversary to the uh, anniversary cake. And we all sang happy anniversary. So just to give you an idea of what it was like, it was a love fest. And yes, when you're directed by actors, um, they always seem to know the right thing to say, to put you in the right mood and have the right attitude because they know what they would need. You know, so Kevin Costner, again, directing me in Horizon, um, you know, he he knows exactly the right thing to say. And the very first day on the set where I was like really nervous, I had a big emotional scene my first day on the set of Horizon with, and there was hundreds of extras and horses and soldiers off in the distance. And 
he, and uh, I showed up on the set, people fussing with my hair and the hoop skirt and the corset and parasol and the shawl and everything. And uh, he's immediately started talking to me about my dad because they had done Silverado together. What was great about that was that I, I was like, you know, I should bring up, I should talk to him about Silverado, but you know, he's so busy, he got a job to do. So I don't want to lead with that. And I, and he did it for me. So he brought it up and we had this lovely conversation about my dad passing away in 2020 and his parents died right at the beginning of COVID. Neither, we couldn't go to our parents, you know, um, because of COVID, couldn't fly, couldn't go to the hospitals or anything. So immediately knew to put me at ease before this big scene. So yeah, being directed by actors is great. And Scott, Scott was lovely. It was another funny story. I also, I was playing a pregnant woman on that. And, you know, really out to hear. Yeah. So usually pregnant woman being held hostage, you know. And at the time, me, the actress, was a smoker. I know that's hard to believe, but I was a smoker. And I remember being on that job and, like, being outside my trailer and, like, smoke, and people driving by in the, like, the studio tour carts, like, horrified seeing this <laughs> give birth, smoke it. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't do this. I'm going to have something thrown at me. Was <laughs> And I felt like lifting up my dress and showing that it was fake. It's fake. <laughs> I remember that very vividly from, from, from that show. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It, you know, I love the idea of, uh, you know, actors who become great directors. I, again, Jonathan Frakes, who, you know, at this point, legendary, uh, you know, sci-fi director and all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, Scott Bakula and, um, you know, uh, Kevin Costner, like, do you, and I, and I see, you know, when I go and I look at your, you know, Instagram and uh, you know, you, you're very involved in kind of mentoring, um, you know, young performers and things like that. Do you have any, is there any sort of uh, desire to direct uh, something? I mean, I know you've directed theater, but anything like film or television, anything in that vein, just out of curiosity. I am no. I have no. There's. I uh, let me. I. Oh my God! I can't speak. My um, children went to an arts high school in uh, Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. Mm. Jack was a theater student, and William was a film student, and he is now put got a film. Where I leave from Utah, and I fly to Palm Springs for uh, a Palm Springs short film festival that William's got, and all of the responsibility, the moving parts what i have directed i directed a production of 12th night at loxa oh uh, after they were um students there i then taught there taught shakespeare there for six years and i directed a production of 12th night there and it was the most fun time I, I ever had it was so much fun i also direct um i don't know if this means anything to you bloomsday on june 16th I, i've done that for the last couple of years i saw that it looked it looked pretty awesome yeah if you want to you know give us a rundown of it that's yeah, that's awesome wrote this book Ulysses it's considered like one of the all-time greatest works of literature and Irish people um I guess it's not too far to say that like in England the complete works of Shakespeare I would say James Joyce's Ulysses is on the same level for an mm. Irish people in terms of pride um and Irish people get together in cities all over the world and will read excerpts. And some, some places re have actors reading the whole thing, like 30, it's like 35 hours nonstop. Yeah. So my husband who's from Ireland has done Bloomsday uh, as long as I've known him. And he recently was doing it at the Hammer Museum at UCLA in Los Angeles and he retired like two years ago and they asked me if I would take on the directing so I directed it last year and I directed it this year unfortunately I was in Utah so I rehearsed with them with the actors and then you know 90 minutes like seven episodes of Ulysses with Irish actors it's kind of great because reading it is such hard work mm. really hard work so to hear actors bring it to life in front of you it's um an easier way to uh, be exposed to Ulysses. So what I'm saying is the little bit that I have done teaches me that I absolutely would never want to be responsible for the money involved, the lighting, the sound, the technology, the locations, the danger. When I hear about these accidents and these horrible things that happen on a set, can you imagine being responsible for that? No, 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 no interest whatsoever. Wow. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of people 
My son did a movie, um, a zombie movie when he was in high school where um, he had all these prop guns and we were shooting in a parking garage and I was terrified terrified and so i had these really strict rules we had a duffel bag and the minute he yelled cut the guns all went into the duffel bag and they weren't taken out until right before because i was afraid the cops were going to see us and and you know we were going to be in a shootout like it's it's a heavy responsibility and lots can go wrong the other day on horizon a windstorm suddenly struck up out of nowhere and planks of wood went flying and were hitting people I would hate to be responsible for stuff like that. It it is such a big responsibility. I feel like uh, a casual fan might feel that, oh, well, the actors do their thing. You know, director of cinematography does their thing. The director just sits back. No, 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 (laughs) no. It's there's so it's it's their name on it. Like every department head and you think, well, how many departments could there be? watch an end credits of anything like (laughs) there's so many there's so many parts like i've said it numerous times on computer resume podcast and cinema shock the fact that any first of all the fact that anything gets greenlit is just shy of a miracle not to mention that anything sees the light of day is is just shy of a miracle because there are so many moving parts so many things can happen uh, you know, it's it's just a monumental undertaking uh, for something like that. So, yeah, it, it's uh, I'm always curious. But, you know, when anybody says no, I'm like, no, no, that that's that's yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's, yeah, I get it. I get it. How expensive it is. How much yeah. money is. It's a miracle anything gets made cost alone yeah not to mention everything else. But, yeah. So, uh, you know, moving along to a very. uh in looking at your resume and revisiting this next thing, I, I am curious as to your experience again, being a, you know, big, uh, being a stand-up comedian and being a big fan of stand-up comedy. I am curious as to your experience on Seinfeld. You did, you had a, a brief appearance on Seinfeld and I rewatched those episodes yesterday. Cause I was like, uh, I was like, Oh man, you know, I don't it it didn't stick out to me so I was like okay well let's rewatch those and and see what that was all about in looking at those things that you did it was very specific but can you talk a little bit about your experience on Seinfeld I think you did like one episode and then two episodes that were it was kind of a two-parter but can you give us the rundown on your experience on Seinfeld I remember that uh I I think funny as not a comedian, not a stand-up. I could, I would never do stand-up comedy, but um, my experience with improv with Tony and Tina's wedding, and that whole thing I was talking about, where the pressure is not to be funny, not to do, not to be like set up punchline, but like that. Um, actually, the Drake, the, the Drake at the more serious, the more humorless, the more intensely dour she is, the funnier it is. And that I can do. Yeah. I, I've talked with a couple of people of like, you know, cause I, you know, I end up getting questioned a couple of times of like, Oh, well, what do you think is funny? I'm just like, if anybody's hubris causes them to get injured, which results in desperation, I find that hysterical. And the example I always use is Daffy duck as Robin hood swinging on the trees and slamming into each tree on the way down. I find that I'll fall down laughing every time but yeah something like that where it's you know very sitcoms have a reputation of like oh here's the setup and but i'm bump there's the there's the punchline but seinfeld was such a unique a unique beast in that a show about nothing think about george costanza his situations were never funny to him the right. mistake they make is they often play their given circumstances instead of the characters. And the actor's given circumstances, oh, this is supposed to be funny. I need to be funny. Well, there's nothing less funnier than somebody trying to be funny. George Costanza was like, I have to get this done. You don't understand. I need to get break into the office and I need to sit at the desk and they need to believe that I actually still have this job. It, it wasn't funny to him. It was life and death because he was playing that. Characters given circumstances, life and death, and the more intense and, and the more hi- the higher the stakes and the more life and death he made it, the funnier it was. But if he had been trying to be funny, 
Yeah. It would have been terrible. Yeah. I, I spoke with a professor of theater at uh, Furman University, um, my niece, uh, who has been on the show. And we discussed uh, the life and work of Susan Oliver, who was in the pilot episode of Star Trek and uh, known for um, really kind of breaking barriers and, uh, you know, with uh, women getting into directing, uh, especially specifically television. But um, she also has a comedy background. And of course, me being a stand up comedian, we were able to connect on the mic uh, about that. But one of the things that we did talk about was that comedy's the comedy's funny to everyone except the person it's happening to. And that goes right along with what you were saying. And I'm a big fan of the straighter you play it, the funnier it is. The Drake at it has such a specific thing that is happening between her and uh, her partner there that it's it's such a almost downplayed, but that just sells it more that they're going through this thing while Jerry and Elaine are, hey, that's a great television. Like it's which just raises the level of everything. Um that's that's so funny. Uh, it's and again, thank you an, again for another wonderful performance. Moving right along, I I see that uh, you were actually had a had a role there on Clear and Present Danger, like one of the early Tom Clancy adaptations. Some say the greatest threat to America. These drug cartels represent a clear and present danger to the national security of the United States. Comes from other nations. Some say the greatest threat to America. The course of action I'd suggest is a course of action I can't suggest. Comes from within. We are two minutes to target. Looks like we've got our own little war. Harrison Ford is Jack Ryan. I'm appointing Ryan the acting deputy director of intelligence. The finding clearly states that our assistance is limited to supply and advice only. He doesn't know about it, Bobby. No troops, then. No troops. He needs to know nothing. He's going to know nothing. The laws he swore to uphold are at risk. The explosion here rocked the ranch of Enrique Rojas less than an hour ago. You said it was going to be a surgical strike. That's a kid they just brought out on NBC. Why was I left out of it? You see everything in black and white. Not black and white. Right and wrong. The honor he is determined to defend is at stake. I'm afraid if I dig any deeper, no one's going to like what I find. Well, no about politics in Washington. I can explain it in four words. Watch your back, Jack. He's coming to you. No security. Once Ryan's gone, we're back online. Based on the number one best-selling novel. There are troops, Jack! I didn't know that! You know I didn't know that! Harrison Ford. You went before Congress and you got the money for it. You went before Congress and you lied to I never Congress. lied to Congress. You lied to Willem Dafoe. I'm on a plane. I'm gonna kill him. Anne Archer. Are you going away again? Be careful. And James Earl Jones. You took an oath. You gave your word to the people of the United States. Who authorized this? I think it's time the whole thing went away. Then it should go away. I will not let you dishonor their memories by telling me you had nothing to do with it. How dare you come into this office and bark at me like some little junkyard dog? I am the President of the United States. How dare you, sir? Paramount Pictures presents this summer's most electrifying motion picture, Clear and Present Danger. What was it like on that set? Because I got to imagine that was another big shift, a big, uh, a different, a different vibe altogether. What was it like on the set of uh, Clear and Present Danger? I have a funny story about that. Um, I had a very small part, like uh, journalist number two. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Donald Moffat played the president, and um, there was so it was journalists at a press conference, mm-hmm. and he was the president. And Donald Moffat had done I Spent Cometh with my father in New York, I think on Broadway. Uh, my father played Hickey and Donald Moffat played um, Larry Slade. And so whenever I have an in like that, I would summon the courage. And and so I went up to him at lunch and I said, hi, I'm Elizabeth Denny, Brian Denny's daughter. And he was like, oh, come sit down with me. And it could not have been lovely or really, really nice. So then we come to shoot the scene and we're journalist number one, journalist number two, journalist number three. And we rehearse it and journalist number one stands up and asks 
the question. It's a press conference. And then he would be like, I think he actually called me by name, said Elizabeth. So I stand up and I ask the question. Um, I have no idea what the question was, but it was something like, when was the first time you heard about blah, 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 in the case of blah, 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 blah. And he went like this. He held his hand up to his ear like he couldn't hear me. And I didn't know what, and I thought, so I repeated it sort of like he was doing a, he was doing a piss take of Ronald Reagan, you know, who they say was hard of hearing, or maybe he was just trying to buy more time to think of the answer. So he, he held his hand up like, and so I repeated the, the question and he did that every single time we shot the scene. And on a break, he came up to me and he said, trying to boost up your part a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the sweetest thing? Oh. It's so nice. I, I had a, I had the good fortune. There was a film shooting here locally, and my wife was just like, "Hey, you know, why don't you take the day, go, go see if you can, you know, get on the set." And um, I end up uh, being a background on this, you know, small independent film here locally. But one of the one of the guys lower on the call sheet was a guy I'd worked with, and was like, "Oh, hey, man, good to see you." And we kind of reconnected. He was like, "Hey, come, come have, uh, come have lunch with me and and Eric." I was like, Eric? And he goes, and it's Eric Roberts, who's like one of the leads. And we sit there and we talk and it was just kind of like, I had this, this part where it's in a boxing gym and I'm, I have a martial arts background. So I'm sitting there just kind of going to town on this thing. Eric comes up to me. He goes, Hey, I'm going to walk by you. I'm going to sort of pat you on the shoulder make sure you turn your head, get your face on camera. And it was just like, Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Cause the camera was behind me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. The actors have been there. They're, they've been there. They know what it's like. Yeah. Uh, those little things, those little things, uh, you know, to, hey, boost, you know, boost the part, repeat, you know, repeat the line or, you know, hey, make sure you turn your face to look at the, th you know, get your face on camera. Uh, those things just mean the world, just mean the world. Have, have you ever, uh, do you have any other instances where, you know, you got to do that or that was, you know, or see that done or who else, any, any other instances like that, that jump out at you? I have an experience. It's a movie I have not seen because I don't like gory horror movies. Uh, Red Dragon. Dear doctor, I have admired you for years. I wanted to tell you I'm delighted that you've taken an interest in me. I don't believe you're telling who I am. Besides, the important thing is what I am becoming. I have some things I'd love to show you. Until then, I remain your most avid fan. Two families killed a month apart in their homes. These attacks were highly organized. The victims carefully chosen. This one is gonna go on and on. That's the same atrocious aftershave you wore in court. I need your advice, Dr. Lecter. If you recall well, our last collaboration ended rather messily. How is young Josh and the lovely Molly? They're always in my thoughts, you know. So it's true the Lecter is actually helping with your investigation. We may have a little over three weeks before this freak does it again. I might not have time. I do. I have oodles. You want to know how he's choosing them, don't you? This is a very shy boy, Well, I know what it's like to have people always thinking that you're different. He is refining his methods. He is evolving. What am I doing here? No one will ever be safe around you, Will. A note hidden in Lecter's cell. The killer wants Lecter to answer him through the personal columns. Lecter gave me your home address. Hi. I'm a friend of your father's. Open your eyes. No. I am the dragon. Give me what I need. Before me, you tremble. I'll call you if I think of anything else. Would you perhaps like to leave me a home number? So first of all, Harvey Keitel, I mentioned my dad, and he's such a Marine, like with capital letters, like 
Semper Fi all the way. Like um, that's all he wanted to talk about. He didn't want to talk about where they had worked together or what they'd done or anything like that. Um, but when you are hired um, in a small part below the title in a movie, and a lot of times you don't even get the full script. I did do a table read of the of the movie, and it was just, it was a remake of Manhunter, which actually is Brian Cox, um, the very first Hannibal Lecter. And so I was cast as a forensic forensics pathologist, part of the team that's investigating this slew of murders. And um, you get the script and you're like, okay, I have this many lines, show up, know, know my lines, don't bump into the furniture, get in, get out as fast as possible. You don't want time is money. You don't want that. And you don't want to stumble on your lines, learn that the hard way from Star Trek, just get in and out. But Edward Norton did something extraordinary knowing because he's an actor that this was the mentality I was coming in with. He said to me, I know that you think you want to look on the microscope with the microscope with the tweezers. And it was like a, a piece of tissue and, and finding a fiber on the tissue. He said, but this is the thing. When you find this thing, we've got it. The whole movie has been building up to this moment. We are trying to build a case. We believe this is the guy. You find this thing, you put it in an envelope. So the slower, the more meticulous, the harder your job is, the more the audience will be sitting on the edge of their seat. We're going out of our mind. Please let this be it. Please let this be it. The suspense is mounting and mounting and mounting. You've got it. Now you've got to pick it up. Now you've got to put it in the bag. It can't drop. Nobody sneeze. Nobody breathe. You put it in. You give it to us and we run. This is from an actor in the movie, not the director, I might yeah. add. Because he knew that I was like trying to get in and out. I also had another wonderful experience with this with Michael Douglas in the game. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, where where you're suddenly working with an actor who cares about the whole, who cares about the the climax of the movie, what the shape of the whole movie is going to look like, and where this little piece of the movie, how it fits in, how fast should it be, how slow should it be. What is the job of this scene in the telling of this movie, this story, in the most interesting, suspenseful, hair-raising way for the audience? Well, what do you get for the man who has everything? Everything. Everything. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you, Maggie. I don't like her. So what brings you to town, Conrad? Everything all right? October 12th. Nikki's birthday. This is for you. Consumer Recreation Services. Call that number. Why? They make your life fun. What are you selling? It's a game. A game? Specifically tailored for each participant. There's a little small. John, chapter 9, verse 25. Whereas once I was blind, now I can see. Now I can see. One day, your game begins. You either love it or hate it. Are you going to spend the rest of the evening prying at that clown's mouth? Mr. Van Orton, is everything all right? Ah, oh, Mr. Van Orton. Have we met? I believe so. Why are you following me? Find out about a company called Consumer Recreation Services. They won't stop, Nick. He's in on it. I paid the bill. I paid him more to make it stop. I need the police. who are gonna break into my house. I need toys with a bunch of depraved children. They're trying to kill me. Who's behind this? Who did this to me? Why? This is all the game. Ah! Right now, I am extremely dangerous. You're behind the whole thing, aren't you? They make your life fun. When you encounter that from actors whose names are above the title, who really care about the legacy that they're leaving behind, what people are going to say, it's very, it's quite moving actually. Michael Douglas and I did 
um, one of the first scenes in the movie, The Game. And uh, every single time we did the scene, he would ask the script supervisor, how much time, how long did that take? And every time we shaved off a second and it got faster, we were, he would high five me. Wow. You know, he also been a producer. So the, the, we, I was his executive secretary running through the day to day, his schedule, his invitations. And it's a very normal, you know, routine thing that we do every day. So it should be very rote, very mechanical. And t- unless, until I got to, oh, there was a phone call from your brother, which sets the whole, the whole movie into motion. Yeah. So- I- I've I've encountered wonderful humility and kindness and caring more about the whole than about just your part in it. Yeah, I was wondering because we we talked about actors as directors and we uh, and we talked about um, you know getting some direction from actors. Um, I wanted to know a little bit. Speaking of the game, I wanted to know a little bit about uh, if there was any interaction or how David Fincher. Uh, as a director, what his what your interaction with him was, being that you were working so closely with Michael Douglas, who of course is a producer and uh, has that background as well. Like, what was that working triangle like? First of all, the thing I remember from the game was I got cast right after I got pregnant, and I was um, I went to the wardrobe, and they were shooting. The last scene first, the ballroom scene was what we shot first. Okay. I had a wardrobe fitting at the beginning of the shoot for the suit that I was going to be wearing in two or three months. Mm. I said to the guy doing the costumes, I said, "Um, you're going to want to buy this suit in a couple of sizes. Like right now I may be in an eight, but in three months time, I have no idea. And so he, he got what I was saying. And uh, did that, and I, uh, yeah, so that was interesting. And I remember we flew up to flew up to San Francisco to shoot the uh, big party scene, and uh, because I was newly pregnant, I, it was the stage where you sit down in your bed to put your shoes on, and an hour later you wake up, so tired, so beyond tired. Um, I, I'm trying to remember specific instances with David Fincher. My filmmaker son would also love me to remember, but I can't really, he was mostly behind the camera and, you know, Michael took care of me and the scene kind of went. One story I do have about David Fincher, I'll never forget, is after the movie was over and that I was at this point hugely pregnant, I was at the Palm with my dad in LA and he saw me, David Fincher, and I was like, hi, good good to see you. And he said, so any day now? And I said, I'm at six months. I still have four more months. And I remember feeling like I'm as fat as a cow. I was hugely pregnant. And people always thought I was carrying twins because I got really, really big very early. And I remember that. But I don't remember. I can't remember anything specifically about his demeanor um, shooting the film. Uh, very focused, very young and very focused. And, you know, it was the game. So we didn't know he, we didn't know David Fincher was going to become David Fincher. Right. Right. So I didn't really pay him that much attention. So one of the things that you just mentioned, I kind of want to dig in just a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned when you talked to the costume, uh, the costumer on the game that you were kind of trying to keep your pregnancy on the down low. What, uh, you know, what is the, What's the reason for that? Why why is that um, such an important thing to do, at least at, at that point in, in that particular scenario? I think I probably had a conversation with my agents and I thought, I have a scene at the beginning of the movie and then this large group scene at the end. I, if I was in it throughout the whole movie, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, I think the woman who played his ex-wife was in real life pregnant, but it fit the story because she was remarried and the character to make her pregnant, you know, it's like, I don't know if you watch Succession, they had to make Sarah Smith pregnant. You know, it was, you couldn't, you couldn't deny it. But I thought I could get away with it and I didn't want to give them any reason to not cast me. Now, I have an exact opposite kind of story, which is I auditioned for Titanic, the movie Titanic. And um, I auditioned for the part that, uh, that, oh God, Susie, Susie, is it Susie Amos who ended up marrying James Cameron? So the, the granddaughter of the old lady. Yes. But then 
I didn't get that. Susie Amos, I think that's her name. I auditioned for that, didn't get that. I think they were talking about me for other parts. Didn't get it, but my husband got cast as the priest. I was newly pregnant, just got pregnant, went down to Mexico to Rosarita Beach. And when I saw the ship that they built this replica and it was actually hanging like this and they were hanging from straps in body harnesses, I was like, if I had gotten cast, I would have had to drop out. I would have had to quit because that really would have put the pregnancy at risk, the baby at risk. So you you discuss it with your agents. I don't think we ever told them, oh, by the way, she's pregnant i figured since we were were shooting these two scenes one at the beginning one at the end and that by the time we got to the beginning of the movie which was the end of the shoot i was only going to be three or four months that we could probably hide it and it wasn't uh it wasn't like i had to do any bathing suit bikini things which i wouldn't be doing anyway uh so we just sort of reasoned our way out of that but if you were in a movie if you were cast in a movie and it was going to be a six or seven month shoot and you're in it throughout, you would, you know, people all the time drop out of things because they're pregnant um, because then, it, and, it, and the story, it, and it does, it's not going to work at all with the story. So I think it's, it goes on a case by case basis, basis. And I think the number one priority is, are you going to be in any kind of uh, dangerous situations like hanging on, on a, uh, off of a boat by a strap? Um, and also by the way, I don't know if people know this. I shot a commercial for Hertz up in Anchorage, Alaska, when I was um, just pregnant, and I was terrified. And you can you can't be too cold. I mean, people who live in the Arctic and Siberia have babies all the time, but you shouldn't ever go in hot tubs and stuff like that. You can be too hot. That's not a good thing to do. Little PSA, little TED talk. Um, so yeah, I worked a lot when I was pregnant. Now that I'm th- thinking about it and talking about it, I actually worked a lot, which is good because you think, oh, it's over. I'm never going to work again. Wow. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. How's, how is that trying to juggle? Cause you had two, right? Two boys. Yeah. How, how, how was that trying to juggle, you know, career and, and parenthood? You know, it's interesting looking back. I, um, when you're trying to audition for things and you're trying to get things going, the worst way to do this is to care too much and be hysterical and frantic and like really desperate. And a lot of times when you're single and you don't have a lot of money, you, you every audition means too much and you go in there and you try too hard. Mm. And when you're pregnant or when you're starting to have a family or you're not getting to sleep because you're up all night long with the baby, your, your priorities have shifted and, so maybe that's why I was working so much because it was like, yeah, 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 I've got this, you know, this kid and I'm pregnant and I was up all night with morning sickness and oh, and I got this audition. So it was just became one of the things that you've got. And so the, it's, it's what I tell young actors all the time. It's very hard to fabricate that not caring. But when you are going through juggling so many important things at once, the not caring happened naturally. And so it's very inviting when you are when you are desperate. The desperation is the last way in the world to get work. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems, you know, it's because you went, because you end up swinging for the fences on something that you probably should bunt, you know, and it's, and it ends up just not being right and not coming across. I, man, that's, that's good. That's good advice. That's good advice. Um, uh, Getting into a little bit more here, looking at, you know, 97 to 99, there was a lot of like really niche sci-fi stuff in your in your resume we got you know gattaca prophecy 2 soldier last man on planet earth like and uh you know it, it's interesting to see like that you're not, again kind of along the same lines of what we were just talking about like i feel like not being a fan of sci-fi might make you perfect to be in a sci-fi thing because you approach it very naturally um any any thoughts about or anything from any of these particular projects that stick out in your mind? I mean, Soldier was de- directed by Paul uh, W. S. Anderson uh, back in 1998. Um, with also with Jason Isaacs, who turned in a great performance in 15 episodes of Star Trek Discovery. Um, any any thoughts? Uh, anything taken away from any of these projects? Uh, Soldier was an amazing experience, and the, um, the fr- uh, a friend of mine was the set uh, designer, set decorator, or concept of the set. His name is David Snyder, and he was the one who did Blade Runner. So 
if you ever see soldier the planet the garbage planet that we live on it was freaking unbelievable absolutely amazing he was programmed from birth to be part of the most invincible army in history But like all scientific advancements... They're practically manufactured using DNA profiles. He was destined to become obsolete. More endurance, better hand-eye. It's a whole different standard. What do we do with him? Waste disposal. His training had prepared him for anything. Except this. Now, on a remote planet, a community of outcasts faces extermination. I want that planet secured by 0600. Well, what about our position? They will be officially classifiable as hostiles. Find weapons and prepare to fight. You have to organize this. For this soldier, it may be too late to feel human. How do you know they'll be back? Because they're soldiers like me. But it's never too late to be a hero. I never saw Jason Isaacs. I never worked with him. I worked with Michael Chiklis and uh, we were the villagers on this planet. Um, you know, it was a long time ago. I, uh, the, the biggest, the, the minute you said it, the, what leapt to mind is I, I then at that point had a nine month old and my husband would bring Jack to the set um, so I could nurse him. Uh, Kurt Russell was lovely. I was very, very grateful for that job because it went on for a long, long time. So it was good, steady income for a while when, you know, you need it. Um, yeah, nothing else sleeps to mind about that. Just a job. Back in those days, you know, it was just like, okay, you audition for a job, you get it, you go and you show up and you're like, okay, this is my life. This is my day. Just another job. I remember going to the screening. There were a lot of children in that movie and being absolutely horrified that they were allowed to watch this movie. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's not a kid's movie. <laughs> Horribly violent. <laughs> so jumping ahead, you know, we've been talking a lot about family. And, uh, you know, we've mentioned your dad, uh, you know, legendary actor, Brian Dennehy, uh, for anyone who didn't piece that together. Um, I saw that you actually uh, got to work uh, side by side in Welcome to Paradise in 2007. You know, having that close relationship and then getting to work with each other how was that being across the table from him in that particular scene really fun it was really mm -hmm. great and i had worked with him before uh he so maybe you know this because i can never remember the name he did a whole bunch of movies of the week he played a cop I, I, i'm thinking jack Ryan, but i know that's not it that's the tom clancy character but yeah. he played um a, a a cop in a bunch of um movies of the week and he did one he wrote and he cast his whole family so i was miguel ferrer's wife the bad guy's wife and uh my husband was in it and my sister and her husband at the time was in it and all of his friends were in it um so you know it was just like it was it was almost like when we back when we were kids and we were in his shows where you know we were the no neck monsters in cat on hutch and root like go here do this and he played my dad and we were southern so we had accents and i had hideous wardrobe um i played a preacher's wife and horrible clothes and horrible hair and it was just like daddy and, you know oh, don't be so mean to him daddy and just like just make believe my son who's an actor he said to me i don't understand why people make such a big deal about this it's just make believe it's just pretend and i'm like stay with that keep thinking that that's a good, yeah, it's a good thought process. Cause I mean, that kind of goes back to that whole, you know, the mentality of the folks that come in just desperate to get the job. Like, you know, it seems like as soon as that focus shifts, like the whole thing becomes different and yeah, that's awesome. But it's, did, were there, you know, we talked a little bit about getting, getting ideas, uh, you know, from actors who have a background in directing and then directors who some, you know, previous actors or some like David Fincher who are more, who were more hands-off at the time. And, uh, you know, did, did you get any advice or any, um, any tidbits from your dad, like in the midst of any of these projects that, you know, kind of formed a wrinkle in the brain or anything like that? My, um, the first piece of advice he gave to me, I was about 13. He said, if you're going to be serious about being an actor, you got to lose the accent. So I don't know how many people from Long Island, you know, but it's a very, very distinctive kind of voice. And at 13, I was probably, you know, talking like this. We're going to go 
sort of Roosevelt Field, you know, going to get yeah. hot dog on a stick. And so, um, but also he changed something for me. I remember talking to him about auditions and I was feeling really ground down and really depressed about constantly auditioning and not be getting a job following. He said, I used to love auditioning. I would come in, I'd just be like, I can't wait to blow their minds. They take one look at me and they think this is what I can do. And I'm going to show them I can do so much more. He said, I loved surprising them. I used to love to surprise them when I would walk into the room. And he said, they have a problem to solve. They've got this part to fill. Here I am, the answer to their prayers. Here I am, the solution to their problem. And I, and so when I teach and I work with young people, I try to instill that in them too, that they have a problem to solve. And here you are to save the day. Yeah. I've, I've heard that sentiment before of just kind of, you know, having the confidence, not the desperation of going in and be like, you're, you're the answer to the problem that they've got, you know, um, and to let some of that kind of influence what you do there um, in the moment. But, uh, you know, again, you, we've mentioned a lot about you uh, working with younger actors and, of course, being a big Shakespeare fan. I want to talk to you a little bit about The Show Must Go Online, where uh, there's it was um, sounds like, you know, born in the pandemic, uh, this particular thing. And, of course, uh, you followed this with uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, you know. What was it like? The first time I saw Shakespeare uh, was Winter's Tale um, with uh, my niece in one of the lead roles. Um, you know, how was this online experience uh, as a self-proclaimed Shakespeare geek? You know, uh, you know, Shakespeare seems to live in the theater. But I mean, I, I know from stand up comedy that a lot of comedy shows went online and it is a different vibe altogether. So how was this, you know, online experience versus on stage uh, experience with the show must go online? Well, I was teaching Shakespeare at the high school, the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. And I had already done um, four years in person and with 10th graders. And every year at the end of the year, we put on a show. And so the pandemic, everything was canceled. March 3rd, we're going to begin our tech rehearsals in 2020. And we were told you have to produce something. So we, I made two Zoom shows with two years of 10th graders. It was just so hard. So when I knew that we were going to remote remote schooling and I'm techno Amish on the best of days, I knew that I needed to figure out how I was gonna do this. So I went online and I looked up any group that was doing Shakespeare in the world, anywhere. And I've made some pr pretty amazing friendships. Let me tell you. So the show must go online. Rob Miles, brilliant genius, amazing Shakespeare director and teacher and educator and actor, by the way. He was doing, he launched this in, out of England where every week they read a different Shakespeare play in the order in which they were believed to have been written, starting with Two Gentlemen of Verona. And uh, anybody could sign on. You just filled out a Google Doc and I, I signed up with the express a desire to learn how to do this so that I could do it with my kids. And I got cast in one of their early shows. I think it was Henry the Sixth, part two. I was Gloucester. I always played men. I did three years tale. I played Camillo. That was an amazing experience because the guy who played Leontes um, is an actor called Colin Hurley, who if you saw the Mark Rylance Twelfth Night, he played Toby Belch. Okay. So he's legendary and he was playing Leontes and we had this amazing scene together and um so if you were watching it and you forgot and you you go back in time to this is it folks there is no live theater this is all we have it was amazing but it was readings we didn't we weren't off book I mean I suppose some people were but I certainly wasn't so we got really really good at maneuvering the text to be up as close to the camera as possible, moving his little square, Colin's little square, to as close to the camera as possible so that I'm not constantly looking down and looking up. So it was a whole completely different animal than getting off book, rehearsing for four weeks. We put these shows together in a week and it was extraordinary. And I made some unbelievable connections. I remember reading The King in Henry IV, part two, and the 
girl who played my son, Hal, Prince Hal was in India. And I did the death scene on the bed, looking at that little square, like this is everything. Nothing else in this life matters except for this little face in this little square and everything else in the world dissolving. And when it was over, remember my husband had to help me get the laptop into bed as the king is fainting on the bed. It was hard for me to believe that she wasn't in, just in my room. It was really extraordinary wow. uh, how much you could be connected virtually. Mm. But now that people are coming back and there is live theater uh, and people are like, oh, it just doesn't work for me. And I'm like, you have to remember, like I started this whole conversation with, imagine a time when you were playing to colleges without the internet, you know, snail mail. You have to cast your mind back to what it was like when this was all there was. This was all we had. So in that framework, in that context, it was epic. It was amazing. And I just read um, Henry Four Part Two with a different group um, on Friday morning. Wow. You know, with a different group. And that group, the, a woman uh, originates in, in Moscow. I've never met her in person, but we get together when we, we read Shakespeare plays and it's amazing. It's wonderful. Okay. Um, so the, the, one of the coolest things was the show must go online happened. I did those, those, three shows and then we had an in-person reunion in september of 2021 and my dear friend austin titchener who runs the reduce shakespeare company he had done about three of the shows too and he was like we're going and i was like i can't go and i'm in the middle of teaching he was like get somebody to sub for you we are going so we all flew to london it was very moving it was wonderful to meet all these people face to face oh that's so wonderful. we have this you know, these friendships that were developed, these these groups of people. And like when I, I played Camilla in The Winter's Tale, and when I met Paulina, my wife, in person, we were like crying. Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. Yeah, it's it's been, I mean, when the other podcast I'm on, Cinema Shock, uh, you know, we started in my friend's room in his in his studio there in his home. And of course, when the pandemic, you know, came down, we all went and we switched to the zoom format with, you know, getting mics and, you know, making the switch. But now with the ease of being able to do it from home, I, uh, computer resume podcast has been a zoom show all along. So it's, it's been, it's been fascinating because I do get to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks who are like yourself on, on location somewhere, or, you know, in LA, New York, Canada, or over in Germany, in the UK, you know, it's, it's afforded me, you know, that. So, but I feel so connected with these people. Uh, a lot of people I have never met in person. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating, you know, the ways people connect and, you know, speaking of making that connection uh, you know, one of the last things I want to get to here is of course your return to the role of Shelby, Elizabeth Shelby, in the series finale of Picard. Two hundred and fifty years ago today, the Enterprise NX-01, the first Warp 5 capable vessel to be constructed by human hands, made its maiden voyage. With it, a crew of 83 souls embarked on a journey, one of bravery, perseverance, and sacrifice that would lead to the birth of what we know today as Starfleet. You hadn't missed a beat, and now you're back on the set as Fleet Admiral Shelby, and I know my jaw hit the floor, and I'm sure I'll, I wasn't the only one, but I imagine because it was very it seemed like a very fast part a very small part of a, a very large 10-hour movie basically talk about coming back into the world of star trek for this appearance in the picard season uh, series finale and what that was like for you to revisit that role after so long so in november of 2021 when we were still testing every day i did a convention in london and met alice Grieg. Yeah. Um, and I took a selfie with her and tweeted it. And I don't really understand tw the Twitter world that well, but I thought, oh, people might get a kick out of this. I asked Jonathan later, because it was like literally the day I came back from London that my agent called and said, they're checking your availability about Picard if you're interested. I said to Jonathan, could 
that picture? And he said, I have no idea. But Terry knew, Terry Madalus knew that um, if it was going to be the final, he had all these people he wanted to bring back, Michelle Forbes, me. And um, and so I was, they asked my, about my availability and I was like, absolutely. Because I've been asked about it for 30 years. So finally, I had something else to talk about. Um, and, you know, it was back in the day when they would, work with like one or two people at a time and we tested, we had to wear masks. I shot it in February of 2022 and had to keep quiet all this time. Keep quiet for, but I, it actually, when I realized that they were shooting seasons two and three at the same time, which was very smart, um, I thought, oh, it's not gonna air forever. So I just forgot about it. I just <laughs> forgot that it, never, wow. it never happened. And then yeah. it's really fun was being asked to go back on the ready room and, and being able to reminisce with, Jonathan and Will Wheaton. And uh, first question I asked Will was, how old were you when we did Next Gen? He was 18 and he's 50 now. I know, yeah. Blows my mind, blows my mind. Oh, well, yeah, it was, uh, again, uh, you know, seeing you come back and it, it took me a second um, to, you know, to see you and to hear to hear the name. And it was just like, wait, 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 what? Oh, oh, did, she's the, she's the one from the thing that did the, ah, oh. and it was, I, I just loved seeing you in the chair and, uh, and the uniform, the hair up the whole, it was just so wonderful. And again, I know it was such a small part in, in this, in this, in this bigger thing, but man, it was so great. It was just, uh, you know, and my, my wife was sitting next to me going, who? And I go, oh, she was, <laughs> she was the one in this thing. And I went and, and she was just like, okay, I get it. <laughs> But yeah, yeah it's hope, such a wonderful I thing. I hope she's not dead. I hope we she comes back. Yeah, I, you know, because I, I know, because I, I almost had the same reaction when they mentioned her in Lower Decks, and I'm sure people have mentioned that to you before the the animated show. Uh, you know, she was she appeared uh, the character appeared briefly, and you know, I know there's been a lot of the novels where the character's gotten some love as well, but. Um, if if you're down, I want to I, I want to be mindful of your time because we're almost to the end of our time uh, together, and you've been so gracious with uh, your time and your stories. Um, would you like to do a lightning round? Oh sure, I am so good at lightning rounds. All right, favorite Shakespeare play you've seen this year? The Bridge, Midsummer Night's Dream, directed by Nicholas Heitner. Who's the funniest person you know? Phil Rosenthal. I went to college with him. Uh, which was the more comfortable uniform, Star Trek The Next Generation or Star Trek Picard? God, no contest, Picard. The onesies were the worst. Lizzy City, they were horrible, horrible. You couldn't eat anything. You couldn't eat a pea without it showing. It was, they were the worst. Do you snore? I actually do. I have sleep apnea. I have a CPAP machine. Yeah. Me too. Okay, I'm going to press pause on the lightning round and just tell you this story really quick. The, the way I found out that I have sleep apnea is I had a sleep apnea attack and it was a big one on my honeymoon. So my wife and I are in the hotel room and I went from prone to hundred miles an hour, standing up, gasping for air, running into the bathroom. And I finally came back out and my wife's eyes were as big as dinner plates. Just like, are you okay? Are you okay? Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. It was not fun. <laughs> Okay, back into the thing. <clears throat> Which movie do you prefer? Total Recall 1990 or Total Recall 2012? Never saw either. That is correct. Okay. Uh, breakfast sausage, patties or links? Links. Really? Okay, okay. All right, cool. Well, that I, that's the lightning round. <laughs> I into them and, and it spurts, the juice spurts out of the very best. That's part of it, right? I, well, you know what? Uh, myself, if I'm answering the question, I'm a big biscuit guy, so I would pr I would probably go for patties. But uh, it, it's 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 up to you. We're we're here to learn about Elizabeth Bennet. So yeah, links. There you go, folks. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for carving out the time to talk with me today. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts before we uh, start to wrap things up about? your career, your life, and and teaching, or just parting thoughts in general? When I was teaching at LOXA, the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, I had this student, Jordan Anderson, who was amazing. First day of school, he auditioned for my production of Twelfth Night. 
cast him as Orsino. He is the voice of a superhero. He's like, if music be the food of love, play on. Like, amazing 10th grader. Um, he got cast. He was amazing. He was brilliant. Um, he took the train 40 from Covina. Um, he, we then, I took my cast to see Independent Shakespeare Company production of Twelfth Night that summer. And he got his picture taken with the Orsino in that show. He just got cast by them in their summer productions of Julius Caesar and A Midsummer Night's Dream. And the company still needs to make $40,000. If people can hear me and they can go to independentshakespearecompany.org, give $5, give $10, give whatever, and tell them that I told you to do it. You're going to make me look like the best board member ever, but you're going to be helping Jordan's dreams come true and providing accessible, free, excellent Shakespeare for all Los Angelinos. And it's so important for people who aren't white to see themselves up on the stage and to be, you know, to learn, I can do this, not only for rich old white people, that Shakespeare and theater are for everybody. So that's a, my passion project. My plea is independentshakespearecompany.org. I'm working on Horizon, so when that comes out, come and support. Don't be so shocked to see how old I look in the movie. I'm playing an old lady, and uh, Michael Rooker plays my husband. So uh, he plays Sergeant Major Reardon, and I'm Mrs. Reardon. We're Irish people, and in the Civil War time. So Horizon, and uh, thank you so much for loving Shelby and supporting her. You, the wind beneath my wings, people. And uh, where can people bother you directly online? Oh, here's a little TED Talk. I get fan mail. If you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and photos to sign, I will return it right away. If you don't include self-addressed stamped, I'm not, I can't. I can't keep running to the post office and buying postage to Germany and the place, far-flung places all over the world. I have to draw the line somewhere. So please spread the word that if your friends and family want to, uh, I'm happy to oblige, but um, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, pay for it. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all over and pretty easy to find, I think. So um, Instagram in two places, the audition magician, because I work with people on auditions, lots of kids auditioning for college and stuff like that, including my boy, Jordan Anderson. I'm so proud of him. My son also got cast by did three seasons with them. So we love them so much. We love their mission of uh, uh, encouraging and, you know, enabling the dreams of young people. So we appreciate any help that you can give. And I am at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all of the socials from all of us at the Computer Resume podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in 10 Forward. on patreon and like rate review and share on all your favorite platforms feel free to send us your subspace transmissions to computer resume podcasts at gmail.com or at computer resume on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok the computer resume podcast was created and produced by mr todd a davis our logo was designed by will martin and justin bishop the opening theme was produced by justin bishop and our outro music was provided with permission by dronode Additional music was provided by Mr. Todd A. Davis and Gary Horn, and the voice of Computer Resume podcast and executive producer, me, Kat Davis. Hashtag LLAP. We'll see you next time. Going through a Star Trek. We're doing Star Trek stuff in space. We probably got some phasers and shuttle pods, and we're going to find a brand new race. How's that for a slice of fried gold?